ding 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 ah ding 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 ah ding 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 ow you know that's from yeah what's that from hi everybody and welcome back to the happy project podcast my name is becky sitting next to me is mr cedric sky city stout what is going on, everybody? I was, I was wondering, like, wait a second, that's not his middle name. It's like a Sky City would be Patrick. a cool middle name. Sky City Stout. Yeah. And we're here on the Happy Project Podcast. And we're so glad that you're joining us today because we're going to talk about some pretty cool stuff. As you probably already know, here on the podcast, we talk about mixed race, mixed culture, and uh, all of the topics that come with that so as you can imagine it's pretty wide scope but that's good it leaves us on our toes figuring out new things every day Mm, for sure for sure this is the greatest podcast out there oh you heard it from him it is (laughs) he said it so that's the truth yeah (laughs) uh okay well before i get started please tell me the best thing that happened to you today the best thing that happened to me today. Yeah, because today, I saw you all day, so. Yeah, yeah. Today was rather uneventful. Mm-hmm. Um, two things. One, I got a really good mm-hmm. workout in. Oh, wait, what did you do? I did my chest and triceps. Oh, okay. So Friday is chest day. That's why your chest is so big today. Yeah, it's like I got the pump it's in there. Swole. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what else? Had some samgyeopsal for dinner. Yeah, we had samgyeopsal. We yeah. ate it together. Mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. so there's this new place like right in front of my apartment that mm-hmm. just opened up. Mm-mm. And like it's so cheap. I need to go there, but it was tasty. Yeah, for those of you guys yeah. that don't know what that is, it's basically like barbecue pork belly. Oh yeah, samgyeopsal. Yeah, some it's one of my favorite foods. Huh? Mm. Yeah, you like samgyeopsal. Mm-hmm. If you eat all the pork bellies, it goes on your own belly. <laughs> yeah, That's what I'm happens. starting to feel that right now. Yeah, for those of you who are watching this podcast on the video, um, I'm wearing a sparkling. I mean, for those of you who are not watching it, I'm wearing a sparkling tube top today. Um, I'm not going anywhere, <laughs> but, and most of you guys aren't going to see it. It looks nice. But thanks. You know, I was just thinking, if you're going to, you know, dress up nicely, who are you really dressing up for? Is it for yourself? Mm-hmm. Is it for your boyfriend? Is it for the rest of the world? Who is it for? And I came to the conclusion, it's for my podcast listeners. <laughs> not even for the boyfriend. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so this is for you guys. Um, and it's a little itchy. I'm not going to lie. I don't often wear spangles like this. Yeah, it doesn't look too comfortable, to be honest. Uh, it's kind of like fish scales, actually. Mm. Um, but it looks great. You let me know in the comments if it's great. <laughs> <laughs> it looks nice. Uh, okay, well, stop fishing around you, Mr. Cedric. I like that. You're being that so distracting right little, now. What? I didn't do anything. <laughs> I'm ready to get into the topic. Yeah, t- you did your research. I saw you researching mm-hmm. it. I'm pretty excited. Yeah, me too. Uh, you excited? I'm excited. I'm excited. So last week, if you tuned in, you knew that we had done an episode on the history and the etymology of the word hapa, right? Um, if you don't know what that is or you didn't listen to it, make sure that you do. You can tune into it anywhere you get your podcasts. And today we're kind of continuing on this trend of more of a deep dive into these words that are commonly used to describe people of mixed race. And the word today that we decided to talk about is... Hafu. Hafu. Yes, hafu. Um, It's a very cute word. It is. Hafu. 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 Yeah, I found it very, very cute. Um, You know, I actually never heard the word hafu prior to a few years Back, I think a few years ago was the first time I ever heard the word hafu. Mm, how'd you hear it? Um, I think I came across it on YouTube, actually. Right. Yeah. Somebody, I think I was looking up things about mixed race and there was something called hafu to hafu. Mm-hmm. Um, it's another YouTube channel that I'm aware of. And I was like, what is that? You know, because I could see the person was very visibly mixed. And then I figured out, oh, this person is mixed Japanese. Oh, I gave it away. Hafu. <laughs> we didn't know what it was already. So Hafu right. basically is describing a person of mixed Japanese heritage. One yeah. of your parents is ethnically Japanese. Right. That is what the term 
pretty much, I mean, is commonly used for today. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of videos on it. Um, I've stumbled across a bunch of those videos over the, the past, I want to say, three years mm -hmm. uh, since I've been on YouTube talking about my story being black and Korean. Yeah. So naturally, I think the algorithm wants to push uh, like half Japanese as well mm -hmm. to my recommended feed. So um, from time to time, I will watch those videos and compare like my experience being black Korean in Korea. Right. Versus the experience of, you know, the hafus in Japan growing yes. up mixed race. Yeah, I found it to be eerily similar in some ways. Mm -hmm. Discussing um, the the experiences of hafus in Japan versus hunyor in Korea. Right. And seeing like, whoa, there's a whole lot more similarities than you might initially think. As seeing right. as Japan and Korea are such different countries, right? You know, but they did face we face kind of uh, some similar uh, obstacles. No, more like difficulties, right. biases. I'm not sure how to describe that. Yeah, yeah. It seems like yeah. It seems like a lot of the growing up in Japan mm -hmm. experiences mirrors those that grew up in Korea right. in many ways when it comes to how society treats them, looks at them, how their peers treats them and looks at them. Sure, yeah. And obviously, as we ourselves are not Japanese hafu, mm -hmm. we cannot give, you know, we can't give our own experience on that. But just by reading all of the articles and all the blogs, I was really uh, surprised. Like, I could really relate to that. And I think that's pretty common with people who have mixed race experiences. The, you're going to find this threads of similarity. Um, but I found it uniquely kind of reminding me of Korea. But before we get into more of the modern age of Hafu, why don't we break down the history? Ooh. Let's go back. Let's do it. Did you like that vocal fry? Yeah, let's go back in a time. Yeah. We need a, oh man, I remember you, we used to have like a little um, going back in time sound effect. Oh really? On yeah, the podcast? Greg, do you think you could throw that in? Here we go. <laughs> Let's go back in time in history. And wow, we're in ancient Japan right now. What year are we in? Um, <laughs> oh my God. Wait. <laughs> This is going off the rails. It's just for, for uh, those of you guys that might be curious why we're a little loopy, it's uh, quite late. Oh, today. this isn't That's loopy. This is normal. Oh, this is normal, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just trying to give an excuse. This is normal. Okay, so let's talk about, um, I think before we get into Hafu, we kind of need to talk about uh, Japan, Japan and like the ethnic history of Japan. Mm -hmm. Did you look into that by any chance? Um, not not too much. So I think you're going to have to lead this okay. and, and kind of enlighten us. Sure. I, I thought it would be very significant to explaining the um, the rise and impact and um, I guess the, the, the sentiment behind the word hafu. Yeah. If we understand more of the history of and the mindset in Japan about their race and ethnicity as Japanese. Okay. We're Japanese. So basically... Depending on where you find your research, it's a bit muddled up, to be honest, mm -hmm. because Japan is touted as a very homogenous society, which it certainly is. Mm -hmm. um, if you go back a certain number of years, I think pretty recently they had done some kind of uh, world ethnic consensus data. Is that what it's called? Consensus? Yeah, consensus. And uh, it came out that people were labeled as 98% ethnic Japanese, mm -hmm. right? So still the majority of the population would be just homogenous Japanese. But if you go way back, way back, way back when, and nobody knows exactly how far back we'll go, but according to this writings that were in the 8th century um, that was describing where Japanese people had come from, Mm -hmm. um, and the story is that the sun god or goddess, I found it in two different articles, god and goddess. The sun god, um, I think... The people were basically descendants from the sun god and the, her or his, if it's god or goddess, offspring with an earthly person, okay, mm -hmm. mortal. And so the Japanese were like, oh, offsprings from this. Obviously, you can see it's just a parable, you know. I don't think people today believe that. But it kind of granted a sense of like um, special. We're special and unique, the Japanese yeah, people, okay. right? Sure, and sure. as you know, um, remember the there's the the dynasty. I wish I could remember exactly my words. I'm so sorry. Uh, Yamato. The word is Yamato. Mm -hmm. Yamato people. And uh, then there was the Yamato dynasty, which is which was established in the sixth century. It was the first and only dynasty that was established in Japan, and carried down through history all the way up to World War II, the end of World War II. The emperor and the royal family was considered as gods, immortals, 
right? Mm -hmm. So as you can see, that parable of the Yamato, the ethnic Japanese people being descendants of immortals. Right. It was carried down and the emperor was also immortal, right? And uh, that, you know, this line of thinking changed after World War II. But up until then, this was a mindset. Really? Yeah. So there's this, this like, ah, oh, we are so special people, right? Right. Of course, every nation wants to think that. Mm -hmm. um, but I found it particularly unique in Japan that they had that. Right. I mean, don't we have sort of, I don't know what you call it, folk tales or, mm -hmm. or just like those stories of like how Korea came to be or the people? Sure. Yeah. Um, we seem to, you can find this in a lot of um, cultures and histories, some kind of story form explaining how we came to be. Yeah. We always want to know, like, where did I come from? Right. Um, and I guess this is, this is one of the stories that was used in Japan to explain where the Yamato people came from. Now, why does it get all muddied up? Because in fact, there were minority groups that were living on the, like the peripherals of Japan and up until I want to say it was about, up until what year? Oh, like 1930s, mm -hmm. almost up to this point, the Ainu people, which were an ethnic group, not quote unquote ethnic Japanese, were very marginalized. And so during the years of like 1868 to 1926, they were trying to um, assimilate the mi minority groups with the right. Yamato people. So um, it's very interesting to see. And sometimes this assimilation was forced assimilation as well. Um, but then eventually became indistinguishable and now just became what we know as this homogenous group, Japanese. Okay. So that was like the really super brief history mm -hmm. <laughs> of Japan's ethnic history. And even that is still contested depending on who you're asking. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so do your own research, but this is what I found overall. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you looked into this one, right? No, but I mean, I've always had in my mind and I don't know where I got this info from, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, Japanese and for example, Japanese, Korean, Chinese, those are like the big three back, yeah. you know, growing up. That's what sure. people knew. Um, like you can distinctly, for the most part, tell, mm -hmm. you know, the difference between the three groups physically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but from what I understand, I think a lot of Japanese do have a lot of mixing of Chinese and Korean right. in their ancestry. That's right. Um, yeah, you know, if you're going to look at the big three, let's say China, Japan, and Korea. And not to say that the other Asian countries are. <laughs> you're much. all small. No, what I'm saying is <laughs> like back in the day, I yeah. just have to clarify. Because yeah, back course. in the day where I grew up, that's, that's what people do. You know, they just knew the, the right. Chinese, Japanese. And also style. depending on where you go, sometimes even Korea, people are oh, like, what? I'm Aren't like, you Chinese? Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, of course. Like because of all of this, like, you know, imperialistic behavior from Japan or nations attacking nations back and forth. Of course, there's a lot of mixing. And so here in Korea as well, like we recently did our DNA tests. Mm -hmm. Right. And I don't know exactly how accurate it is, but it did show we both had a small percentage of ethnic Japanese blood. Yeah. 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 yeah that was I very mean, interesting. I think mine was like 12% or something. I like think that, I was higher 15. than yours. Mm -hmm. It really shocked me. <laughs> I never expected that. Yeah. Oh, I'm still shocked now. Okay. Going back to Japan though. So this was something I wanted to bring up in, um, about the late 19th century to the 20th century, uh, Japanese scientists start to investigate eugenics. You know eugenics, right? Eugenics is like there's the perfect race, mm -hmm. and you know if you you have to weed out the bad blood or whatever right. because you want to maintain the purity of the blood. So they started becoming very um, attached to this mindset, and eugenics was really at the heart of a lot of politics, some public health movements, social movements, and um, so it was very hotly debated. But the practice was generally widely adopted. Um, and actually, up until 1996, there was a law that decreed compulsory sterilization of the disabled people in Japan. That law was abolished in 1996. Really? That's how long this, this concept of eugenics mm -hmm. was around in Japan. It Dang. took that long to get rid of that idea. So anybody who was not, quote unquote, pure Yamato people, Japanese, um, were not worth having children to carry on right. this bloodline. To pass on their gene pool. That's basically. right. Yeah. So as you can see, this comes head to head with the idea of having mixed children mm -hmm. in Japan. 
Um, so mixed children, I was looking back like Hafu, how far does Hafu go back? And I found a very interesting guy. Maybe you heard about him. His name was um, William. I think he's a Dutch sailor. He was an English sailor in the 1600s. Did you read about him? Mm -mm. Okay, I thought this was so funny. In the 1600s, there was a sailor from England named William Adams. He settled in Japan. He became a samurai, which is extremely rare for a foreigner to become samurai. Mm -hmm. And then they had Hafu kids, and their kids' names were Joseph and Susanna. Very, <laughs> in, very not Japanese. In Japan. Like, I'm trying <laughs> to imagine being named Joseph or right. Susanna in Japan in the 1600s. Um, so unique. Right, but that was the farthest back I could find. Like, oh, like documented. Oh, so hundreds, in Japan. hundreds of years. Yeah, so of course it wasn't common. Yeah, but people have always been around mixed Japanese, and I guess it just came more to the forefront of the public when more and more Hafu kids were being born. Right, and do you know about when that was? Uh, I do not. Yeah, so eighties was kind of the boom. Okay. In the 1980s. So 80s was sort of the start then, because I know a couple of decades ago, it was probably, um, from what I read, mm -hmm. like one in every 250 or so uh, mm -hmm. kids being born were hafu. Mm -hmm. And then you fast forward to today, whereas it's like one in every 20 right. around there. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's amazing how quickly it doubled. Mm -hmm. um, I had pulled up some information that was saying in the 70s, there was like, it was like point something percentage of the population was being born as Hafu. Right. And then the 80s, it doubled. And it was about in 2006 when that number of international marriages peaked. They had pulled up like the census, like 45,000 families, international families. Mm -hmm. And the number has steadily declined a little bit. Um, but it does say that in 2017, about 3% of the population made up by international uh, families. Okay. So you can see that there's still a significant minority in Japan, but they are noted and they're present. Right. Right. I mean, that's still a pretty large number in terms of like modern day hafus, mm -hmm. you know, being just integrated into society because mm -hmm. these are literally Japanese people, mm -hmm. whether they're half or not, they're still Japanese, mm -hmm. and so they're going to school. Mm -hmm, they're mm -hmm. doing things in Japan, speaking the language, and it at this point it can't really be ignored or like treated as oh this is very uncommon. I mean it's still a minority, heavy minority, but the trend is obviously pointing elsewhere. It is so it is yeah in that direction. yeah I feel like Japan now has to do something with this. They're yes. faced with this reality of okay we have this newer situation from what we're used to. So what do we do with it? Because right now it seems to still be causing like issues with people and tensions and things like that. So, yeah. So yes, it is true that though the minority, they are still the minority group. It is a growing number. And with the world becoming more globalized as it is, I mean, it's gonna be inevitable. And it doesn't mean change is always nice. Sometimes change is very painful and sometimes change is very messy. But I find that if you embrace change, it makes the process a whole lot easier for right. everyone. Um, and so in this case, the ideal of the pure ethnic Japanese people, whether people carry that at the forefront of their mind or not, um, it's changing. Yeah. And I think there's two options that you have. And this isn't just for in Japan, but any country that is facing becoming a more heterogeneous, heterogeneous, heterogeneous society, right. um, it, the change is coming as more interracial families are existing and there are more mixed babies being born and either you can go kicking and screaming or you can start to embrace these people. Right. And I would say, especially in Japan as such a highly homogenous country, um, it takes a lot of attitude change on a general large scale right yeah yeah and this is perfect for bringing up miss japan yeah a couple of years ago oh, yeah okay i thought yeah. you'd look her up yeah yeah so miss japan um she was actually a half black half japanese and i believe this was 2014 2015 2015 yeah, yeah. 2015 and so uh her story is really really um it's pretty common in terms of how she grew up just you know sort of being bullied in school because mm -hmm. she grew up in japan uh african-american father mm -hmm. um and japanese mother mm -hmm. and you know she just grew up being bullied and facing i guess what 
most half, you know, kids face. And so um, growing up, she went through that. And then as she was, uh, I believe she was in her early or late teens, Mm -hmm. she got into modeling Mm -hmm. and she also had a friend. She had a friend who... (laughs) Uh um, who ended up committing suicide. That's right, yeah. Yeah, she had a friend that ended up committing suicide, and that was sort of the turning point Well, it's not just a her. friend, it's a hafu friend. Right, a this hafu friend, that's right. Right, because of, you know, the way that they mm-hmm. were teased and bullied and not, you know, feeling accepted. Mm-hmm. And so, by the way, uh, I didn't mention her name. Her name is Ariana Miyamoto. Mm-hmm. And so Ariana, uh, she decided to go ahead and focus on, like, modeling, and she wanted to be Miss Japan. yeah. So I'm sure she had a lot of reasons for it, but one of the main reasons is for her to actually show that, hey, as a half Japanese, I could still represent Mm. the people of Japan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so she she won it. Yeah, she won. She won it. And, (laughs) you know, fun fact, she also was top 10 of the Miss Universe that year. So that was really cool. Uh, The the, the thing is, you know, some people embraced it. Mm -hmm. Others you know, didn't so they much didn't. That's because right. they were yeah. faced with the new reality of, okay, we have a hafu who doesn't necessarily look like us yeah. and she is supposed to represent our country. Right. And so they had an issue with that. Right. Yeah. I was looking up some of the Twitter remarks um, and I found them to be <laughs> extremely polite. Honestly. Oh, really? Um, but Japanese people are polite. Even being so like negative, <laughs> right. it was still polite. And I was like, oh, okay, Yo, Korean well done, people well were just like, no, just go no, hard. No. But like one of them I saw was like, oh, not to be disrespectful or something like that, but how can a hafu represent Japan? And I wonder if it was, it was if it was genuinely asked, mm-hmm. like, really, is that possible? You know, or if actually it was out of mean spiritedness hard to say you know through text or whatever um but it raises a very fair question to be honest yeah can a hafu represent japan i think it comes down to then what makes you japanese which is always the question that we are faced with even on the happy project when we're talking about koreans specifically and mixed koreans like what makes you korean and it's a very hotly contested question depending on who you're asking the answer is always different it's your citizenship it's how you look you have Mm -hmm. to have korean blood no you have to speak the language you have to have born and raised here right and it seems like we don't have a clear answer on that yeah yeah and i feel like in japan it was and is quite similar right i mean i think that's because japan generally and i could say this about probably many countries that have a lot of like some of the same ethnic groups or like one or two main ethnic groups in Mm -hmm. it, like they're faced with the reality of something testing what they've always known or Mm -hmm. something like in their minds, probably threatening what they always knew Mm -hmm. to be their identity Mm -hmm. and who they are and what represents them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's funny to, to think about because on one hand I can understand it. Right. But on the other hand, like I can, I can honestly side with obviously the half who or the half E because what if I wanted to run for like Mr. Korea? Oh, you'd be great. You think so? Yeah. <laughs> you'd be so handsome. You'd win oh, everybody. <gasps> you should do the Mr. Universe like bodybuilding oh, one. Oh, for real? Oh, you should. I don't know. I think, I think. Uh, you could do it. You could have like a 12 pack again. Dang. <laughs> yeah, again. Yeah, bring it back. It's, it's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. So like, it's like, what if I wanted to run for Mr. Korea? I don't know if there is a Mr. Korea. I know there's a Miss Korea. Mm. But uh, yeah, what if I wanted to run for it? I already know that, well, I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess that it would not go well. I'm very interested, actually. I would get a lot of publicity. Sure, sure. Right? So let's just say I grew up here, went to the military, uh, I didn't speak any English, Mm. and I was just like any other Korean. But just based on how I looked and the fact that I'm half, would I be able to make it to the finalist stage and be able to represent Korea? I'm going to say no. Yeah, Unless, I'm, you know, people are more liberal minded than I think they are. Right. But I think it's a little feeling. too early for that. Yeah. Like, I think eventually it will come to a point where maybe a half Korean will be able to represent. Mm-hmm. So that opens up a whole nother can of, well, how Korean do I have to look or does does one have to look to mm-hmm. be able to represent mm-hmm. as a halfie? Mm-hmm. Right. Because yeah. you and I are both half Korean. You people can see you as Korean before they see me as Korean. That's right, yeah. You know what I mean? And it's purely by your looks. Yeah, 
Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I think it's going to be a while. So coming back to Ariana, um, you know, she was faced with a lot of um, criticism, but, mm -hmm. you know, I can kind of see both sides. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I would say that she should be able to represent Japan, mm -hmm. in my opinion, mm -hmm. coming from a non-Japanese, coming yeah. from someone outside of the culture. So I respect the culture and I respectfully just give my opinion from an outside perspective. I think she should be able to. She grew up in Japan. Mm -hmm. She speaks mm -hmm. Japanese. Mm -hmm. Why not? Yeah. You know, because if she isn't, then that is by definition discrimination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what yeah. I mean? So. And the government, actually, the Japanese government counts her as Japanese. I found that the con the census mm -hmm. in that's the word, not consensus. Census. It's just census. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the census. They actually don't check your ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So, like in the U.S., for example, you would mention like, oh, I'm Caucasian and Caribbean or whatever. I don't know how it's broken down exactly, but in Japan, it's not. They will mark that you're interracial family. So that's how they have the numbers on that. But out of those interracial families, they don't actually have the set number on who is Hafu mm -hmm. and what makes you are. So why did I bring that up? I thought it was an interesting point. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. My mind just traveled a different direction. Mm. Oh, speaking of Ariana, if you look her up on Instagram, I just looked up her name and uh, I followed it and it only had like 2000 followers. And I was like, wow, she really keeps to herself. And then I found out it was fake. But I'd already followed it, and I was like, "Oh, it's embarrassing." <laughs> oh my gosh. So I unfollowed She's, it, and yeah, I found she her probably real. Has a lot of. She has way more than two thousand. But whoever made that fake account made it look really real. It's probably like a fan. Yeah, but they didn't say it was a fan. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's besides the point. Here's something I wanted to point out concerning: um, Would you ever be able to represent Korea? Like, if you were Mr. Korea, mm -hmm. you know, in in Korea, and um, also turns out in Japan, as I was reading these articles. There is um, a pecking order. There is a, an, an order of what is considered attractive and then not, mm -hmm. right? And as same in Korea, in Japan, it's like Caucasian and Japanese. They are taking over on the media, right. on the TV, the comedies, whatever. You can see so many of these like doll-faced, pale skin, hafu, Japanese, Caucasian girls. Right. Um, so popular. So there's another girl. Her name is Naomi Osaka, and she's Haitian Japanese. Her mm -hmm. mom's Haitian, her dad is Japanese, and she's a tennis player. And she was actually born in Osaka, but at the age of three, I think, she moved to the U.S. to train <laughs> to play tennis. For real? The age of three, yeah. Dang. Uh, her dad was pretty dedicated. So um, she's a professional tennis player. She was ranked number one by the Women's Tennis Association and is the first Asian player to hold the top ranking in singles. And the thing is, she represents Japan, right? And uh, they had, there was this interview with her parents and her mom was saying, you know, she, even though she grew up in America, um, she was born in Japan. And even though she is part Haitian, she feels that she is Japanese. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's cool. It's cool. And then I uh, Naomi had said in some interview that actually she can understand Japanese, but she doesn't speak it so well. Mm. And she's more comfortable speaking in English. Okay. Which is very interesting. Yeah. Um, and then she's representing Japan as, you know, a national tennis player. I wonder if that would fly in Korea, to be mm. honest. I think it depends on what it is, mm -hmm. right? I mean, to represent, probably not. But for example, if she was a U.S., mm -hmm. um, let's just say uh, Naomi was a Korean mm -hmm. U.S., like a half Korean U.S. Mm -hmm. person that won, mm -hmm. I think Korea would be proud. Would they? Yeah. Even even if she's black. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. I think because same thing with Heinz, Heinz Ward, yeah, right, yeah. who's a black Korean uh, football player in right. NFL. Um, you know. I think they would celebrate the success, mm -hmm. even though she's American, mm -hmm. but they would say, oh, she's half Korean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if she were to represent Korea and play for the Korean team, ah. I don't know. I don't know if it would be the same, you know, because, I wonder. because she can't speak, I guess she right. wouldn't be able to speak Korean. That's right. Which is obviously a huge part of the Korean culture yeah. because the ethnic group has their own language. That's right. You yeah. know, and or the so culture, culture, I should say, it. I should say. Yeah. 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 
So I found her to be also interesting. And、um, I think generally she was embraced, right? But it seems to be like we get a little tetchy when it's kind of about representing who we、mm-hmm. are, right? And it looks like somebody that you don't feel is representative of your,、yeah. your people, your、yeah. people group. I mean, I get it. I think、mm-hmm. I get it. You know, I. It's, it's tough, man. Yeah. It's tough. I, I already know that I can't represent Korea in many ways. Maybe one day. I mean, maybe one day,、yeah. right? But, like, I know as it stands right now, because I grew up in America,、um, not just because I'm half that I can't、mm. represent, but it's just because I have a little bit more of. I want to say I, American culture is embedded within me.、Mm-hmm. And obviously, I had Korean cultural influence, but I learned that after I moved here, oh man, I'm definitely not. As cultured in Korean culture as I thought,、mm-hmm. you know, as far as modern day culture. So I wouldn't feel comfortable necessarily representing Korea in certain things.、Mm, in certain things. In certain things.、Okay. Like I wouldn't be, I wouldn't feel comfortable being Mr. Korea. You know what I mean? <laughs> ah, I see. Yeah. 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 It's, it puts you in a hard place. It puts everybody who is in this mix, you know, pulled to one side or the other. Because the thing is, like, I don't think you can really fully 100% be one nation or another nation or an ethnic group, culturally speaking, because it's very difficult to raise a child up in 100% immersed one culture or the other.、Mm-hmm. Like,、um, yeah, because even if you're growing up in Japan and you're speaking Japanese, great. Okay, you have Japanese culture ingrained in you and you understand it. But what about, say, your dad who is American? He never got to. Also, go through all of these you know, stereotypical American things that American kids go through. Right. Right. And so, that is part of a culture that you will be missing. So, I have to wonder about that too. Like, I know we always say, and in a way, it is true, like, you are 100% this, you're 100% that. But there's no denying that there are going to be shades or nuances、um, of one culture or another that will be lacking. Right. Yeah.、Um, and it just seems to be. The inevitable truth.、Mm-hmm. Now, the word hafu, because hafu is an English loan word for half. Some people had taken maybe offense with it because it really signified, like, oh, I'm only half of something. I'm not half, I'm a whole. In fact, I'm more than a whole. I'm double. And so they create another word called、mm. taburu, which means literally double. It's like the opposite of what hafu was representing. Right.、Um, and some people were like, okay, that's overkill. <laughs> But、right. other people embrace that term as well. Mathematically, it does not work, but yeah, I get the point. Right. Yeah. And so the word hafu is still very commonly used in Japan. And as far as I can tell, I don't think it's offensive, unless a person decides that it's offensive, really. There was this filmmaker.、Um, let me pull this up for you because I found his quote to be quite.、Um, Quite significant when we're talking about terms,、mm-hmm. and which is what we've been doing last episode and also this episode. So,、uh, it's a photographer, and he created this book of portraits called Hafu to Hafu. Remember, I mentioned Hafu to Hafu. Yeah. So, I believe he's, he's the one doing the YouTube channel as well. His name is Tetsuro Miyazaki, and he is Japanese and Belgian. And so he realized when people were asking him during sports games, like, who do you support, Japan or Belgium? He was like, whoa, forced for the first time to come head to head with the idea, like, I have to pick a side, right? right. Which is kind of what it comes down to. Actually, people ask me this a lot too.、Mm-hmm. Um, and you probably get those questions too. Which is better, Korea or America? Where do you want to live, Korea or America? Right. You know, right? You always get this. So, anyway, he started publishing、um, a portrait book, Hafu to Hafu, word photography port. Project about mixed Japanese identity. And he was just taking portraits of Hafu from all over the world. And、um, it was very fascinating. And it looks really, really cool. And like when you look at those portraits, I think it strikes a certain chord.、Mm-hmm. And I imagine Hafu, who were looking at these photos for the first time, were like, well, people out there look like me, you know?、Right. There's some sort of sense of、um, cohesiveness, some f- community identity when you see that. I, I, I guess I'm speaking for the both of us here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, what I wanted to point out was the way he described using the word hafu. Because some people are like, wait, why would you use that? Because you're not half of something, right? Which I totally understand. 
we also hear that complaint to us mm-hmm. as well. And so, yeah, you could dismiss it. You could just be like, okay, you're right, whatever, we don't care. But what he said was, um, what he was talking about Hafu, the choice of the book title itself, Hafu to Hafu, is a statement because the label Hafu has different connotations depending on whom you ask. So then that's why some people were starting to use Daburu, right? You, you should be double double. And uh, he was personally saying he doesn't have strong feelings about the word because the reason why some people don't like the word Hafu is often because they associate this with negative experiences from the past. But it's not like using double is going to make you fit in more. The problem right. is not the word, but rather the attitude behind the word. Mm. And I thought that was a very powerful statement. I guess that put it into better words than what I was trying to say last episode. Sure. If you remember. Sure. I mean, that kind of reminds me, like, the fact that there is, and it's it's all perspective mm. at the end of the day, but the fact that there is a word to describe uh, halfies or the fact that halfies or halfus are described in that way, mm. by nature, inherently in the word, points out that they're different, mm-hmm. right? And also the the word meaning double, same thing. Yeah. It's like, it's just constantly reinforcing your different Mm -hmm. it could be like in a good way or in a negative way but it's just a subconscious reminder at least to the individual who is Mm hafu that i'm different right you know and take it as you as you want to take it because some people can take that as a really good thing Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know oh i've got two cultures i can like flip back and forth i can represent both and then others are like well uh, you can look at it as a glass half empty yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's just, I mean, there's no escaping the reminder, I think. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying, like, it's time to embrace that. Mm-hmm. It's time to embrace the change. Yes. It, I mean, that's going to have to mm-hmm. become the new norm, yeah. I think. It kind of like, I think, yeah, I think it, it always takes time for these changes to happen. I think, you know, originally it's something so so startlingly different yeah, than what you're yeah. used to that you're like ah oh, and then you react out of fear and fear can turn into disgust or hatred right it starts like that and then maybe you're getting a little more educated or maybe you know some sentiment is changing and then you're kind of like okay okay you're not so bad and gross but i still don't want you around that i feel like it changes 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 take some time mm-hmm. where it's like all right okay i acknowledge that you also are your own separate being it's cool you can live here too but we're not going to interact it, like it kind of goes like this it stops being you're the enemy and then starts being like well you're not one of us right you know, whether it's openly stated or not and then ultimately i think integration happens and more acceptance it just takes a whole lot of time mm. I noticed this in one of our comments, actually, on, I think it was my video that you were appearing in. And somebody was saying, like, oh, wow, it's so interesting that you guys are both half, but um, aren't you guys going to have so much problems in the future, especially if you date each other? Oh, well, can't blame you for finding love, which is such a bizarre uh-huh. comment, right? Right. Because it's like, oh, okay, like Thanks. you're kind of, <laughs> yeah, like kind of accepting, but at the same time, really pointing out still this underlining sentiment that exists mm-hmm. that being half, being hafu, being hunyar is not a good thing. Yeah. That you're going to have trouble. Right. Yeah. But there doesn't need to be trouble, guys. No. Come on. And not every hafu goes through like identity crisis. Or, sure. I mean, I think a lot of them do to a mm-hmm. certain extent. Uh, but there's a big spectrum, mm. you know, I didn't go through a major identity crisis. Mm. I mean, I went through little periods of, you know, wanting to discover who I am mm-hmm. and uh, where I fit uh, amongst both cultures. Yeah. But uh, and I didn't have a troubling childhood growing up. But mm. that's a big misconception that yeah. Hafus or Hafis or biracial people will face like these troubles from society. And, right. you know, and, and, it, yeah. and, and it does happen, unfortunately, yes. probably more often than not. Right. You right. know, I was you know, quite fortunate, but it's not always the case. This was something that was significant in um, one article that I was reading. There's so many good articles, by the way, on Hafu, because it's it's a very unique experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was this article that was pointing out um, that said, what is the, the biggest factor in a uh, Hafu child's life is their family and their parents how is their upbringing because society will tell you one thing and um, but your parents have to instill in you a solid sense of identity right and belonging 
And it's so funny because I feel like I witnessed that in you. Yeah. So yeah. clearly. I know that I preach that all the time mm-hmm. too, because uh, I actually remember doing a video a little over a year ago uh, and it was titled uh, something along the lines of advice to parents of mixed race kids. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah in which that was kind of my point is, uh, you know, the parents have the power to uh, influence how the child grows up mm-hmm. and how the child perceives not only themselves, but mm-hmm. how, you know, the child reacts to the world yeah. and oh, the world's perception key. of them. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So, uh, and again, it was mostly because of my dad, cause my mom was, um, you know, she, she was super positive in many ways and like how, uh, she viewed the world and how mm-hmm. she thought the world viewed us. But mm-hmm. my dad was the one that was like, don't worry about what people thought, mm-hmm. uh, think, and, you know, make sure that, uh, you're confident in who you are. So mm-hmm. he was the one to instill that in me. And because of his confidence, I was able to be confident in that. That's why these days, whenever I like get negative comments, because I get a lot of negative comments, uh, not I mean, not a lot, but it's <laughs> so many. I mean, no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I get far more. You do get them, though. Yeah, you get more than me. Super racist That's comments. Sure. I mean, like especially on the videos where um, you know I'm talking about my my experiences. Mm-hmm. 99% of the time, they don't bother me. I don't yeah, care, yeah. you know? And then it, I know, it rolls off like yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's, you know, attributed to my upbringing. My I parents. would definitely say so. Mm. And this is something else I wanted to bring up because you are a very fortunate case. Um, especially if we jump back, let's say, one more decade. Let's jump back oh, to the man. 70s. Yeah. I mean, extremely fortunate case that both parents existed because historically speaking, especially in Japan, World War II, big rise of Hafos is Americans, American bases in Okinawa, especially. So that's where you're having a lot of, they would call you either American Hafu if you spoke English at home or Okinawa mm-hmm. Hafu if you spoke Japanese at home. Oh. Uh, rise of Hafos do specifically because of the influx of American soldiers. But then as we know here in Korea as well, we witnessed it. Many of those children were given up to adoption. The mother was rejected for being a single mom. Right. Didn't want to keep the child. And there's there were stories about like after the war or after the Americans men would leave, these children were given up to adoption and in an orphanage, over 700 children, and their parents never came to see them. And so it's no wonder that there will be a whole generation wandering, mm-hmm. who am I? You yeah. know, and feeling extremely lost and buffeted from side sure, to side. Sure, sure. So I, we can never, I, I think, um, I can never say like, well, you just need to have a good, strong upbringing. Oh, yeah, because that's true. Nobody, that's true. I mean... It's not guaranteed. No, of you know? course. I was super, super fortunate. Yeah. You know, I want to go on record saying that. And I realized that um, not everyone is as fortunate to, mm-hmm. to have grown up that way. And you're also a very positive person. Yeah. Like you just, as a kid, if you watch this video, <laughs> you're just like My home videos and dancing stuff? around I'm like a, a super complete happy kid. fool and singing all the time. And you're just smiling and having a great time. I think that also plays a part in your positive outlook on yourself. And yeah. The Definitely. Because yeah. identity is hard, even if you have a great upbringing. Mm. And even if you have really like confident, loving parents and surrounding society, like it's still hard, you know? It's just a struggle I think people go through. Um, that's the joy of life. Yeah. <laughs> and an additional joy and obstacle for people of mixed race. And I imagine for Hafu. I'm very curious to know if um, we have any Hafu listeners, how do you feel about the term Hafu? How do you consider yourself? Where do you fit in in Korea or Japan society? And as you know, Japan society is it is changing. But another significant factor I just wanted to bring up why Hafu is so significant, especially now in this current age, is the population in Japan is rapidly aging. In 2060, I think they're going to say one out of three people is going to be over 65 years old wow. and so the generation that's growing up there's a big proportion is going to be hafu but if japan society as a whole their laws the way that they are treated is not ready to accept this influx of a whole new generation of mixed kids i mean that will really be some trouble mm-hmm. and so it is something to keep in mind and I'm, I'm really curious to see okay i'm watching what's gonna happen in japan next and um and i really give big props to ariana uh ariana Miyo, Miyama, miyamoto oh, yeah I miyamoto. Butchered that one ariana miyamoto for um really standing strong definitely. and definitely presenting hafu so well and the, she even had said like i don't find the term negative and in fact instead of shying away from it I want to present myself as hafu, 
and represent Hafu people are Japanese、right. as well. So I really give big props to her. And if you follow her on Instagram, make sure you find another <laughs> one.、Um, if you're curious more about Hafu, there's a great documentary out there that's just by the same name, Hafu. And it came out in 2013. It was、um, many, like started in 2019, 2009, I think. So a couple of years documentary.、Um, By Megumi Nishikura, and she's Japanese and Irish American, and they were basically interviewing Hafuz in Japan and discussing this、um, ongoing issue and、mm-hmm. watching the trend and seeing, okay, what's going to happen and all of that, and bringing into the forefront、um, this, this issue of new, a new era of Japanese, I guess,、right. of Japanese people, Hafu. So if you want to learn more, I think that's a great place to start. Um, very interesting. And of course, there's a whole lot of great articles out there. And if you are Hafu yourself,、uh, it will be great to hear from you to see what you think. See if we did justice. Yeah.、Know? Yeah. And again, we respectfully say that、mm-hmm. we're from the, I guess, outside perspective. Yeah. You know, I mean, we can relate because I do think Korean culture and us being Hafis in Korean culture is very、mm-hmm. similar, but it's not the same. We recognize that. Sure. We absolutely do recognize that. And I hope that it doesn't leave any. Distaste either. I'm just saying this as a caveat because I honestly think, depending on your upbringing,、mm. you may have a negative perspective、sure. on one country or the other, depending on where you're from.、Um, specifically, we know that Japan and Korea politically are not on good terms. And historically、right. speaking, have had so many clashes and all of this crazy stuff. It was something I kind of wanted to bring up because there is a lot of anti Korean sentiment in Japan, specifically from this one group. It has a very long name, but you can. Look it up because they held anti Korea rallies, anti Korean rallies. And this is even focused to Korean Japanese because、mm-hmm. there are mixed Korean Japanese living in Japan. Can fly under the radar, but if you imagine having this kind of anti sentiment happening、right. in such a public way, it can't be easy.、No. So I actually hope one day to visit Japan, the Happy Project team, to go and meet、uh, Korean Hafu and see what their experience has been like as well,、um, given this cultural and historical. Clashing、yeah, of the two be, nations. That would be very insightful. Yeah, so researching this has been really insightful for me、mm-hmm. and taught me to check some of my prejudices for sure. So、um, if you fall under the category Japanese hafu, Korean hafu, write in. We want to hear from you. Okay, is there anything else that you wanted to mention? No, that's it actually. Oh, good. Because I think I'll just open up another can and just keep going.、So、oh, really? We have very limited time. Yeah, yeah we're、no. running out. I'm okay. I'm okay. okay.、We'll, we might have to do another like, follow up another in、round. the future. Yeah. yeah, depending on how the comments come in、mm-hmm. and,、uh, or listener mail that we get,、um, we are open to doing a little bit more research for you guys. So let's get the dialogue running. That being said, it's time for listener mail. Yay. All right. So, as you guys already know, we get a lot of listener mail. And、um, can't read everything, but we got a great message here from a young lady named Tanisha. Tanisha. So, Tanisha said this, and、uh, it's a bit long, but I did want to read it out. Here we go. Hi there. My ethnicity is actually Caucasian mixed and First Nations Canadian, Cree. My mother is white, my dad is First Nations or American Indian. My dad himself is actually half, but he didn't. But he didn't actually grow up with his dad, and he was only raised with the First Nations culture. He tends to recognize himself as full because that's what his world was full of Cree. It's all a bit complicated, but it has caused me to feel pretty isolated. I spend some time on the reservations with my dad when he works there, and I meet family, but mostly I would say I feel like I'm half. But then things got more confusing because I have Asian features, and my family and friends joke that I'm Asian. And then my parents gave me an African name, which causes even more confusion to the people that meet me. <laughs> They always ask me, What are you? And that question itself is a bit hurtful.、Mm-hmm. It was really hard to grow up like that and feel isolated by groups, not feel like I fit in, and to not have an identity on either side. I'm just mixed, and I feel like that's my identity. Side note, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Embracing that.、No. Continuing. I was content with living like that, but then I am now in a serious relationship with a man I met in Canada who is Korean. I love him to pieces, and I really think he's my soulmate, my better half. He's been an amazing partner, and we are planning to live in Korea someday. Well, lately we have been talking about marriage and kids, and of course I am excited, but then I'm so afraid for our future children because I know how it feels to be mixed race. 
Not only that, but I have a small part of me worrying my Cree side would be so watered down that I'm afraid my children wouldn't have any clue of its importance to me and my father. Part of me hopes that our children would be born completely looking Korean, hoping that my Asian features might help so that they wouldn't have any confusion about their identity when around others. But then another part of me wants my kids to be looking mixed so that they could experience the journey of self-love that I have had to go through. I have expressed my concern to my boyfriend. He doesn't seem phased by the possibility of children being confused. I think probably because he's so completely Korean from a homogenous society, but I still worry. I was wondering what you think about my story and if you would have any advice for my very mixed future family. That's from Tanisha. Wow, that's um, thank you for writing that in yeah. and being so transparent, open so and candid. Honest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's uh, definitely a common common concern that I think Becky and I we hear all the time. Well, you know? yeah, we do hear that a lot, but um, I wonder if it is so common. Mm-hmm. You know, I really wonder how many people actually sit down and think, hmm, how am I going to carry on my culture to my children? Because we, we, I think we sometimes think it's just for granted, especially if you come from just like a full. You know, white family or full black family. It's like, hey, you know, it's, it's granted. You grow up in this family, you just pick up the culture, right? What's there to teach? But um, when you're mixed, I think you have to be a bit more dedicated, a bit more particular. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I find that um, a lot of the younger couples these days do concern themselves a little bit more with that. And I think a lot of it is because the exposure, like there's mm-hmm. so much more information and access to information and videos mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. you know, hearing other people's experiences and it can sort of add to the fear of the potential of, you know, how their kids in the future will grow up yeah. in this sort of uh, world that just doesn't really embrace everyone just yet. It's mm-hmm. very discriminatory. So, um, you know, going back to what we were talking about before, uh, you know, you could take this as advice or just maybe as encouragement, but, uh, uh, you know, my my dad did a really good job in just instilling confidence mm-hmm. in me and just he didn't make it a huge thing to like teach me, you know, his culture. Mm-hmm. It was something that just came out and it was something that, uh, you know, he would in subtle ways just teach me. And so I think if you're, you know, even intentional in teaching Mm -hmm. your kids that culture, I think that is something that they're going to appreciate. And one last thing I'll say is, um, you know, God forbid, if they do go through hardships in the future, Mm -hmm. um, you know, as long as you're there as that backbone and support, you know, that might ultimately be good for them down the road oh yeah you know what i mean point. when they yeah. learn how to deal with those conflicts and yeah. and overcome that you, you know again yeah again hoping that your kids won't go through that you know mm-hmm. in the future but if it does it's not always a bad not thing a bad thing yeah especially if they have the coaching and guidance from two right. loving parents yeah i agree and i guess um the most important thing is to see if you and your significant other are on the same page right you know um, coming as he is, you know, full-blooded Korean from a homogenous society, that in itself is not a bad thing. But truly, it can be harder to understand what it was like growing up mixed and some of those difficulties that you faced or things you've yeah. had to wrestle with. So being able to communicate that with him, I think, will maybe put some of your your fears at rest. And uh, bringing kids into the world is a big responsibility regardless yeah it sounds fun oh (laughs) (laughs) i can't wait i like other people bringing kids into the world (laughs) yeah but um it's a lot to think about and i imagine that as you guys go along with your relationship and see how your family blooms you'll learn a lot about yourself too and um i think it will come out pretty naturally like ah I want my kids to carry this on. Mm. Um, and it's cool that you're thinking about it now. And we wish all the best to you, Tanisha. You yeah, and your definitely. whole family. Excited and, for you, honestly. I know. He loves kids. I do. Yeah, he really loves I'm kids. awkward with them, but I love them. You are. I love it's, the idea of It's them. funny. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> Just thinking Anyways. about it. Well, that being said, Tanisha, thanks for writing in. If any of you else who are listening... <laughs> not grammatically correct but you know who you are and you want to write in and you want to share a bit of your own story or you have a question or something uh you can always get in touch through dm on instagram at the happy project leave a comment here if you're watching the video format of the podcast or if you're tuning in on the podcast anywhere you get your podcasts you can always send us an email at the happy project at gmail.com we want to hear from you thanks so much for tuning in bye cedric bye becky I'll see you right after we're done. (laughs) 
Thanks for listening. We are The Happy Project.